so my topic for today is building cyber resilience for idm peer environment so first of all who am i i am an electrical engineer with a passion for cyber security i've been working in the industry of cyber security for the last 6 years primarily doing security testing uh, vapt audits risk management risk assessment compliance audits etc so uh, i generally focus a lot on how i can secure infrastructures and applications and how we can help organizations move from a uh, security maturity level of let's say 0 or 1 to maybe something like 3 or 4 to a scale of 0 to 5 okay right so here we have like a lot of open source technologies right and idempier happens to be one of these uh, open source ERP technologies. So typically companies who go with IDMPR or such open source technologies also prefer to have other open source tools around the ERP or around that uh, technology. So what happens is uh, when they go for open source for all the good reasons, many of the companies also have a fear that they are lacking in security because it's open source. So many of them definitely ask you this question, right? Is it secured? <coughs> So that's what I'm going to address today. So here's some statistics. Basically in 2022, somewhere around uh, more than 206,000 vulnerabilities were detected. That comes around like 560 new vulnerabilities every day. Now that's huge, right? Nobody of us can even name like 10 new vulnerabilities that happened yesterday. Forget about 560. So how are we supposed to deal with these? And then there's another biggest challenge that is 80% of these exploits are or basically 80% of these vulnerabilities are being exploited before it is even published somewhere officially saying this is a vulnerability. So if you see there's something written as CVE, that means uh, com there's a database of all vulnerabilities which is called as the common vulnerabilities and exposures. So therein every vulnerability gets a unique ID. Okay, so any vulnerability that is officially published will have a CVE, but 80% of those will be exploited for 23 days straight before it <coughs> even gets registered officially somewhere. So that means we are all really very, very vulnerable and unfortunately there is nothing we can do about it unless and until somebody gives us a security patch. So there comes another biggest challenge. Now 60% of the data breaches have happened just because we did not have the right security patch in place. And not because it was not available, it was there in the market, it's just because people did not install it uh, and maybe because they were not aware about it. So the focus about uh, this entire discussion is how vulnerability management and patch management can help us in secure open source infrastructures because to be honest, <coughs> Uh, even proprietary tools are just as vulnerable as open source. So there's no, no sense in saying that you know just open source is vulnerable and maybe proprietary is not. The only difference is proprietary uh, companies or basically companies like Amazon or Microsoft, they will bring out a security patch as fast as 8 to 15 days after the vulnerability is identified. For open source it takes somewhere around 33 to 35 days, that's like at more than double the time. So that's where the actual challenge comes in. So it's actually a lucky coincidence that we happened to meet here today because this just happened last week. So Microsoft came out with a patch that patches more about 75 vulnerabilities in one single security patch. So something like this has not happened in the recent past. So generally they patch about 10 to 12 at the max in one single security patch or update. But this time they have gone about 75 CVEs in one single security patch. Of which 9, uh, nine vulnerabilities were critical, that is on a scale of 0 to 10 they were rated as 9 to 10. So a score of 9 to 10. And the others were somewhere in the medium or high band that comes somewhere around 6 to 8 or 6 to 9 basically. So pretty severe <coughs> vulnerabilities. And now the biggest challenge for companies with this one is when you have to deploy a patch in any, any organization, you have to test it first because there are a lot of dependencies that we have on some particular version of a software or an operating system, right? So some of my features may not work if I suddenly patch a package or a library all of a sudden. So I need to test them. Now the biggest challenge for companies here is, though it is mitigating about 75 
vulnerabilities straight away. It is also going to cause a lot of issues in all the other areas, typically on thick clients that people have, that is desktop applications. So because most of these 75 were actually focused on the OS level, it is going to affect the thick clients. So these are some of the top 10 vulnerabilities that we have typically in all kinds of applications, web applications mostly. So I'm sure you must have heard about OWASP, that's the Open Web Application Security Project. So we deal with a lot of these like broken authentication, injection vulnerabilities and XML external entities across all applications, be it ERP or, or any, any other. So there are some really simple tricks that we can do as developers or implementers in order to avoid these. For example, um, let's say uh, input validation, right? I mean, uh, when we, co uh, let's say, I was just looking at uh, some of the previous presentations and I saw a lot of dashboards were showing, uh, showing about the invoicing or order lists and how you process them. So I saw a lot of user input fields where people actually have to put in the name or the address or some other details. Now, uh, le let's just think from a hacker's point of view because I, I happen to be an ethical hacker, so I generally think from a very different way, okay? So uh, let's just say that I want to hack into an application. What will I do with so many user input fields that I have in front of me? I'll probably try to inject some really malicious code into it so that it uh, tampers with your backend and maybe gives me some insight into the database or some, some data that's not supposed to be visible to me otherwise. So normally if I just try to inject scripts, they go to the backend, they render and they fetch some data that I had asked for. But as developers, what you can do is you can actually restrict the, uh, the special characters or you can restrict a certain number of characters that can be put into these input fields. For example, a username field or a name field, for example, should not have more than 200 characters. I mean, nobody normally has a name longer than that, right? So if we can actually restrict the characters or the special characters or numbers depending upon which user input field you are talking of, we can actually reduce certain attack scenarios completely. So another thing is uh, yesterday, I think Chuck was saying something about heap memory, right? So there is this attack called as buffer overflow, wherein we actually try to overflow that particular memory buffer just by putting in more number of characters or by injecting uh, or uploading files that ha exceed the uh, specified limit. So let's say you have a, a file upload field which says it's recommended to upload a file with one MB size or not more than one MB size. And if I somehow manage to upload something that's way more than one MB, let's say five MB even, that's definitely going to harm your system because the memory allocation is not uh, designed in a way to hold 5 MBs, right? So it's going to cause an overflow. It can cause your website or your application to slow down or even to crash at certain points. So there are certain uh, ways, like for example, we can also talk about session cookies and how you manage your sessions. So sessions happen to be a very important aspect of every application, right? Now, uh, let's say a session cookie does not die out after the session actually ends. Now that's a big problem. Because I know of a lot of scripts we can, which can actually steal your cookies directly from your browser. So I don't even need credentials to get into your application that way. So if your session uh, has died out but a session cookie is still present in your database, I can simply use that and get access to your sessions. So these, these are some of the most popular attacks happening these days and there's some very simple ways we can avoid them as uh, implementers or as developers. So again, I, I'm not really sure if I have captured it right, but there could be some more technologies that I have missed, which probably happen to be a part of the item peer environment. So a lot of these uh, come out with regular patches almost every week, every month that most of us are not aware of. Sometimes we have dependencies on some specific versions, so we cannot uh, update them. So in such scenarios, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to make our systems more secure and more resilient to attacks? So the first uh, way is to have a risk-driven approach 
to cyber security so when you know that you have a risk or have a vulnerability it's best to evaluate how much risk is it right so how likely is that in, uh, attack uh, going to happen so risk is basically calculated on only two factors one is the impact of the risk and second is the likelihood so uh, let's say for example it's very very likely uh, for um, Okay, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the geography of India, but okay, there's this uh, desert in India, okay, in Rajasthan. So it's very unlikely that there will ever be a flood in the desert, right? But it will be very, very likely that there will be a flood somewhere uh, where it's near to a river, correct? So that's how we can actually identify based on what risk we are carrying how severe it is and then we can decide whether or not we are going to go ahead with fixing it or are we going to just uh, you know accept that risk and maybe try to figure out how we are going to secure the other aspects <coughs> so uh, it's just an analogy i could be wrong but uh, generally they say that security should be like an onion that is should come in layers for example with uh, idempier maybe we can say that the first or the most innermost layer happens to be the idempier core so if we secure that, we are like one level in security. Then maybe we should try to uh, secure the plugins, which ha could be seen as the layer two, because they are optional. Some people may or may not use the plugins. Then we can say that the third layer could be the uh, hosting services that we use, the web servers or cloud or any, any other hosting platforms that we are using. So that could happen like the layer three. So if we can secure that, maybe we are somewhere in the next layer of security. And then finally, maybe after that, we can go with something like VPNs or proxy servers to, you know, uh, completely eliminate the um, external access to our platform. So somebody who is trusted can only access the ERP and nobody else can. So why it is important to go through this layered approach is, uh, even though we completely, you know, keep it off the internet or keep it completely uh, on the internet, we can't still eliminate the insider threats. So if a hacker is already present inside your environment, you can't actually prevent that just by blocking off the internet connectivity. So the next one is, of course, rigorous vulnerability and patch management. The third one is identity management and incident response planning. So even after speaking a lot about security, it's always said that no company or no organization is 100% secure. So what is secure today may be vulnerable tomorrow because hackers are coming up with new techniques every single day. So considering that it's important to have a strong incident response plan with us. So what do we do if an incident occurs? So now as implementers, when we uh, implement a solution for customers and if something happens, they come most probably running to us because we know a lot about that system than they do, right? So in such cases, we should always have a backup plan as to how we are going to handle the incident. So next one is mostly for organizations uh, who are themselves implementing an uh, ERP like Idempia. So they themselves should have a strong awareness and hygiene policy wherein they uh, educate their users about the password strengths or the other security best practices that they can uh, take up. And then finally, a business continuity plan, which almost every organization has. So this is typically what a vulnerability management cycle looks like. So uh, vulnerability assessments must be done pre-implementation and uh, of course uh, post-implementation as well. So that is pre-deployment when you have uh, developed something new and you are about to deploy it and also after you deploy it because uh, it can happen that before deploying it uh, on your test environment, you're using some different uh, technologies or different hosting services and the production environment may differ slightly. So it's basically uh, scanning, identifying the risks, mitigating the risks or uh, managing the risks in a proper way and then re-scanning and validating it continuously. Uh, it is expected that you scan or uh, assess your vulnerabilities at least <coughs> Uh, every three months so that you are up to date and you have a fair idea about where you are carrying the risks. So what are actually the advantages of doing this regularly is that uh, it gives you an accurate visibility of all the attack surfaces. 
it's better to know where an attack can happen than to be completely in the blind. So next is it helps you to have a faster detection and mitigation cycle if you do it frequently. It helps you in effectively utilizing all your IT resources so that uh, if, if I know that one, uh, one system is compromised, I can easily switch it to something that's of the similar configuration. And uh, also helps you to be compliant because uh, there are lots of compliances, be it in healthcare or in the finance sector or depends from region to region, right? So your client could be from any of these regions or any of these domains and may have some very different compliance requirements. So vulnerability management actually helps a lot in giving them assurance that yes, you are also in compliance with what are, whatever are your local norms or regional regulations. So finally, this is what uh, typical vulnerability management metrics will look like. It gives you a complete uh, device coverage. So all, all the devices in the environment are expected to be covered under the vulnerability assessment process. So it will give you an overview of what are the critical assets, what could be the most critical vulnerabilities that you're dealing with. So percentage of the closed vulnerabilities, what is your own patching rate or you know mitigation rate? So and how, how well are you doing uh, as compared with the industry standards? And are any of your vulnerabilities reopening frequently? And if so, like you can look into it, like why it is happening and how you can fix that. Right, so finally, uh, patch management. So this is typically the process what it should look like. It will give you a visibility into your asset inventory. So there are a lot of tools uh, which actually help you with patch management. Uh, it's pretty much automated. You just have to put up all your uh, inventory or the assets into that tool and they give you an insight about where you stand, like which, which uh, version you're using. Is it the latest one or is there a, a patch available? And you can deploy it pretty much automatically. So it reduces a lot of human efforts there. So you can download the patches. Sure. Um, sorry. Sure. Oh, we, we need a moment. I have a question. Yeah, sure. So for a database, for example, the I'm curious about for what you guys do in the room. Do you guys apply regular patches to the database? Just without without maintenance windows? Does anyone does anyone auto apply patches to a database? And now automatic approach? No. So do you do you have a periodic approach? Yeah, I guess um, what usually we perform sometimes depending on the <coughs> security policies of the company is that we synchronize uh, some of the recommendations in our site because we know that, for example, we have either a certifier with Postgres 14 or something like that. Maybe we can apply some of, of, of their patches from Postgres or something like that. But with some of our companies, they have some policies when they can apply every two months, every month or something. So it's, it's more like an coordination work, but not in an automatic way. What about, okay, so the JVM, so I did here super sensitive to the JVM, yeah. change that, that positive. so the database, what about everything else, all the ancillary things, do you let, do you let it auto apply, or no? But nothing auto, nothing auto apply? Yeah, basically, basic principle is that you should see what suits you, specifically for the Secondly, you should not be applying it in new cases. Our strategy is to do minus one. If you have a latest patch, until this has been tested, the previous patch has been tested and certified that there are no out of the additional bugs which has come out of that sort of patch, so additional issues with that patch. As a policy, we, we take a call that we will not apply, we <coughs> run it on the test bed or whatever for some time and then we go to the without until we see the impact of so for, for me, I use Ubuntu, an apt is the typical tool that I would use to upgrade a package. So sudo apt, upgrade, update, update and upgrade, right? That's the typical. That doesn't give me what you just said, correct? That just gets whatever's coming down the pipeline. That's like a Windows update. Yeah. yeah. Is there, and I'm assuming the tooling mm -hmm. would give you more control over 
yeah so what what he said is absolutely right you have to test it first on the test bed before you deploy deploy it on any live environments but these tools give you complete control over like which asset you want to actually deploy the patch on and which assets you want to exclude from the new patches as well so if you want to know about the tools uh, it's like manage engine and kaseya are some of the good ones uh, That's what I mean. we should be getting more of open source oh i'm so sorry <laughs> No, I'm I'm sorry, but I don't really know of any trustworthy open source <coughs> one as uh, as far as patch management goes. So uh, I I have used only these two or three of them. So I have used Iraqi. I used some Iraqi. Oh, okay. So, but they are very expensive. Right, I know. Uh, security tools are very expensive, unfortunately. <laughs> right. So yeah, please. So. Um, just out of curiosity, what's the average time to review a patch? Every six months, every three months, every year? When, should, when, when things happen? I think Pedro I asked the question. That's more of an ah, organizational okay. decision. No, no, no. I, 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 I think, think he answered yeah. the question. You no, said no, no, it's an organizational decision. That doesn't help. I, I, was help asking, I was asking the same question four years ago <laughs> <laughs> to a security <laughs> principal in London one of my, my customers. What they told me is that um, depending on the, depending on the risk that they have in their company, for example, if you're working with healthcare, that you need to be certified with certain <coughs> level of privacy or something like that, um, they are more strict. And for example, in this organization, they used to have operating system patches have to be reviewed every three or four days and that they have oh, to wow. be up to review it, test it, every week yeah. and apply it in all the environments every two every two weeks maximum something like that that's yeah, operating cool. system yeah. operating system yeah and on top of that they have databases they have network components mm -hmm. they have things like that but they have an army of uh, devops people <laughs> <laughs> doing that and they used to have chefs and they used to have ansible things like that helping to do that mm -hmm. things so if, if, if you have that amount of risk uh, for sure, you will be having a strong policy in, in those places. So, typically, uh, you will have a profile of a CISO profile, CISO profile in a large organization. They decide on the policies of your security policies, patch management, yep. identity management. Yep. That's not a profile which lies with the CIO. It lies with the CISO who reports directly to the CEO. He does not have any reporting because he is a security guy. So, uh, or sometimes through security head in case it's a sub super security process. So they decide on the strategy of when the patch will be done, when ID will be checked, uh, and, 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 and so forth, profiling, and, and so forth. That, that, that's, that's a pretty large topic. Robert, okay. what was your answer? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you said that. How often do you apply uh, updates to? How often do you operate operating system? Yeah, yeah patches. <coughs> it's done by Ansible uh, because the Amazon quite mm -hmm. host and uh, there are uh, minor patches and if you activate them, maybe Amazon also do it automatically. So it's not automatic for you? Uh, I, I don't remember it's done by Ansible or it's automatic. Uh, Right, so uh, <coughs> the last part is about incident response. So like I said, it's never going to be that we are 100% secure from all kinds of attacks. So it's really important to know how to deal with them uh, if and when the time comes. So the first thing is about understanding that we are under attack. Sometimes that doesn't happen for as long as 50 days straight. So hackers can actually lie dormant in your systems for a very, very long time. So it's important to have a good detection system in place. You can have intrusion detection systems or you can have a seam and sewer system which will actually give you an insight on what systems are under attack and how you can go ahead with it. So if, if you see some system is actually being attacked, the first thing you do is you contaminate it, con uh, so sorry, contain it, contain it as in um, 
you remove it completely off the internet you can simply remove the ethernet cable if that's that's simple as that but the idea is to quarantine it completely from the entire uh, network and to keep it isolated until you actually identify if it's a real attack or not okay so generally companies will wait for one to two days to verify if it's an if it's a real attack and only then they will quarantine it it's advised that you don't do it if if you think that it is under attack and if you have even the slightest suspicion quarantine it first and then analyze it okay next thing is eradicating whatever is uh, affecting the system it can be a live hacker it can be a malware it can be a ransomware it can be pretty much anything so once you identify that it is important to eradicate it sometimes it requires you to do a complete reinstallation of the entire system it can be a reinstallation of the os it can be reinstalling your database or any any uh, item that's affected basically finally recovering so for recovery it's very important that you have a backup so it's expected that you have daily or at least weekly backups of all your systems so that you can recover them to the latest uh, recovery point so recovering and then post incident is basically about uh, figuring out how it will not happen again so doing a root cause analysis and trying to identify actually how the hacker came into the system in the first place and then trying to close all the doors accordingly so that's pretty much it thank you so much Uh, if you have any questions, please. We have a, a, I think half of you may be already now, and you never have that. But we have a European security procedure mm -hmm. and a policy about how to report security vulnerabilities and how do we want to manage that. We have uh, uh, ma three main lists. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, three main lists. We have the code security. We, we receive the email and evaluate the list. And then there is a level one security. And I think there is a, no, no, there is a level two security. The, the third level is to announce the vulnerability in forums. Mm -hmm. And we usually do after. Oh, the past okay. Is so I did see uh, vulnerability management and responsible disclosure program on your website. Yeah. Uh, however, I, I would like to give you a suggestion. Uh, is it possible to have something like a hall of fame uh, wherein you actually thank the bug bounty hackers or the ethical hackers who uh, you know came to you saying this is a vulnerability? Because coming from an ethical hacker's background, I know how much it uh, feels to see uh, your name or photo in some hall of fame. <laughs> <laughs> and since you are so much community driven, it can actually help you because there's a lot of uh, bug bounty hunters out there who do this just, just to see their photo on some hall of fame. <laughs> to do that? First request for some mm -hmm. money, and when we say that uh, we don't have this program, they say to at least publish my name somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and we also don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is it possible? Is it possible to ask for mm -hmm. like a similar things how about? Yeah, sure. So there are a lot of ways in which we can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so there's multiple ways to do it. First one is doing it completely automatically. So there are companies like Simulate, which give you a um, deployment of their agent on every single machine you own and it happens completely automatically. But the problem is it's very, very expensive and it's a subscription model. So you have to pay them every month for that. The next uh, other way is to do it manually, where uh, you can hire a group of hackers, uh, or someone like me basically, who helps you do the attack. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, we call that red teaming basically, wherein you just give us the name of the company or the URL that you want to be attacked, and no other details are asked for. 
we try to get into your systems as if we are real hackers and we try to simulate every possible scenario that uh, actual real world hacker would do so unless uh, and of course we don't tell you when you are being attacked and we also don't tell you after you are being attacked so it is also to test whether you are in a position to detect an attack if it ever happens so. uh, i'm asked at one company so like mm -hmm. they ask 8000 euros for this yeah that's simulated so actually uh, we we did a project with gaurav yeah here itself in bahrain it was a very similar activity on a public transport company in bahrain so uh, we were sitting in india like the entire team sits in india and we managed to get access of the it head of the company so we actually got access to his pc and you won't believe it but it happened through a very simple phishing email <laughs> so they they use some uh, cards to actually swipe in and get into the bus so we just put in a mail from his superior the cio saying that uh, there's an issue with the card and many people are not able to access uh, you know they are not able to get in on board basically so look into this asap and we had attached a small word file saying the, here are the screenshots of what's happening so please look into it and uh, we made it sound pretty urgent so this guy actually opened the uh, word document now what we had done is we had purposefully made the images a bit blur and we had embedded macros in the word document and then a, uh, a small red line was written saying if you can't see the images please enable the macros and this guy did that so as soon as he enabled the macro we got into his system and <laughs> so it was very simple like we never thought it would work with the IT head but somehow it did <laughs> yeah so uh, any more questions all right thank you, thank you.